Все, ма. Obesity. Why obesity is important? Obesity is a place of extragonadal synthesis of estrogens by the conversion of androgens from adrenal glands by aromatization. It's only additional factor of hyperestrogenism in patient's organism. Black race is a genetic predisposition for the formation of uterine myoma. Contrary, why multiparity is reduced risk factor? Because of multiparity means that the patient during her life has uh, many periods of hyperactivity, of corpus luteum, of placenta, and high levels of progesterone in their body. Progesterone can reduce the risk of uterine myoma, suppress the mitotic activity, but unfortunately, not always. If you ask me why smoking reduces the risk of uterine myoma, I can answer that smoking means that it's a chronic intoxication of organism. Chronic intoxication of organism leads to the abnormal activity of ovaries, abnormal production of estrogens, and the lower risk of formation of uterine myoma. Of course, I don't recommend smoking of, as a method of prophylaxis of uterine myoma because the smoking is connected with so many other complications. And the statistics, on another hand, speaks that it's a reduced risk factor. Etiology. Uh, uh, really, uterine myomas are not defectable before puberty and after menopause. What does it mean? It's only demonstrate the role of steroid hormones in the genesis of uterine myoma. Myomas relates to female hormones. Really, what hormonal disturbances could be important in the pathogenesis of uterine myoma? I already said that hyperestrogenism is a risk factor for uterine myoma, but not only. It's a result of interaction between hormones, steroid hormones, estrogens, and the target organ. Target organ is the uterus. Target tissue is uter are uterine muscles. And of course, the question of reception, the quantity and the quality of estrogen receptors are very important for the result of influences of hormones on the, uh, in the formation of uterine myoma, reception and the level of estrogens. By the way, my friends, Rule of receptions of receptors is very important, and the level of estrogens could be absolutely or relatively high. What do I mean? I mean the imbalance between estrogens and the progesterone. In patients with low progesterone due to anovulation, due to the lack of activity of corpus luteum, have got relatively high levels of estrogens and as a result the formation of uterine myoma of course i mean chronic situation chronic anovulation not only one or two episodes of anovulation within one year normally healthy women have these episodes of an anovulatory cycle during a year and it's not a problem it's not a cause of uterine myoma. We mean only chronic situation, prolonged, unopposed stimulation of uterine muscles together with endometrium, of course, by estrogen hormones. What about progesterone, my friends? We said that multiparity is reduced risk factor, but we know that progestin may promote mitosis of myoma. What explanation of this situation can we give? Sometimes we see the 
growth of myoma even during the pregnancy. Theoretically, the period of pregnancy is a time of prevalence of progesterone, but sometimes myomas demonstrate excessive growth in this situation. And we know that these myomas are caused by progesterone high levels. It's also necessary to remember and understand. How can we classify uterine myomas? According to the location, of course, first of all, about 90% of patients demonstrate uterine body myoma. About 10% of patients have extra uterine forms. Uterine forms. According to the relationship between myoma and uterine myometrium, we separate intramural myoma from 60 to 70 percent of patients, subserous myoma about 20 percent of patients, submucous myomas from 10 to 15 percent of patients. What for do we separate? Do we divide myomas into three these groups because of clinical presentations, symptoms, kinds of diagnosis absolutely depend on the location of myoma. Now, pay attention for extra uterine forms. Broad ligament myomas. Either epidenculated myoma projecting towards the broad ligament or parasitic myoma attached to the broad ligament. Cervical myoma are located in the cervical region. Parasitic. On rare occasions, the pedicle may get torn and the fibroid gets its nutrition from the amental or mesenteric adhesions. You see parasitic myoma in the left part of slide. According to the classification, you see these kinds of location of myoma at this picture. Subserous myoma, subserosal pedunculated myoma, submucous myoma, intraligamentary, and pedunculated submucous myoma. Mostly, my friends, myomas are multiple. Initially, it's only one zone of activity of mitosis, and then really whole or sometimes part of uterus is already affected by fibroids. They may have different consistency, different shape, different size, but finally, in two, five, ten years, all myomas are already multiple. Gross appearance, pathology of myoma. They look like round, smooth, usually from false capsular covering. There are pseudo-encapsulated, my, fr my friends. Why it's important? They can be clearly demarked from the surrounding myometrium. Dissimilar to malignant process, this benign pathology could be operated and the myomectomy is possible and the simple surgical procedure. It's easy to differentiate affected tissues and the not affected tissues for the partial resection of myoma for myomectomy. Gross appearance, you see it at this picture. Transverse section shows light gray color, a rule like arrangement of an intertwining patterns. You see them at the picture, at these two pictures. Microscopic examination shows that myomas composed of smooth muscle cells and varying amounts of connective tissue. 
individual cells are quite uniform in size, spindle-shaped, have elongated nuclei. Non-striated muscles fibers are arranged in interlacing bundles of varying sounds running in different directions. Histological picture of fibroids is at this picture. The tumor consists of smooth muscles and fibrous connective tissues of varying proportions. Originally, it consists of only muscle elements, but later on, fibroids tissue intermingle with the muscle bundles. As such, the nomenclature of fibroids, also commonly used, is an appropriate and should better be called either myomata or fibromyomata. What secondary changes could be in fibroids? There are degeneration, atrophy, necrosis, infection, vascular changes, and sarcomatose change. What kind of degeneration could be? It could be Hyaline degeneration, cystic degeneration, red degeneration with a specifically patognomonic for the period of pregnancy, degeneration with calcification. I said already that during the pregnancy and puerperium, red degeneration is most common. Venous thrombosis and congestion with interstitial hemorrhage are typical for the red degeneration and lead to the color of this kind of degeneration. In this picture, you see the combination of two types of degeneration. Upper part of uterine myoma demonstrates red degeneration middle and the lower part hyaline degeneration atrophy atrophic changes occur following menopause due to loss of support from estrogen there is a reduction in size shrinkage of the tumor similar reduction also occur following pregnancy enlargement my friends it's the best result of the development of myoma when the patient achieves premenopausal age without indication for surgery and atrophy is a normal result normal final stage of its development that's right for the patient when you can avoid the operation avoid possible side effects and complications of intervention surgical intervention necrosis circulatory inadequacy may lead to central necrosis of the tumor this is present in some mucous polyp or pedunculated subserous fibroid it's clear my friends dissimilar to atrophy necrosis of all locations of myoma are always indication for the surgery and the mostly immediately because of necrosis of fibroids is a possible cause of such heart complication of situation as peritonitis sepsis and finally septic shock it's necessary to avoid it avoid it to prevent it by the surgical intervention infection the infection gains access to the tumor core through the thinned and the slower surface epithelium on the submucose fibroid this usually happens following delivery or abortion intramural fibroids may also be infected following delivery 
You must understand that uterine cavity is not absolutely sterile. And in thin endometrial epithelium, endometrium, the possibility, the risk of spread of infection from the uterine cavity inside into the uterine muscles, into the uterine muscles affected by fibroid is very high. And it will be the infection as a result. Vascular changes, dilation of the vessels or dilatation of the lymphatic channels inside the myoma may occur. The cause is not known really now. This kind of degeneration changes in endometrium not so typical. It's possible to meet it really. Most important, most dangerous kind of secondary changes in fibroids is sarcomatose change. It's the result of transformation of initially benign tumor to the malignant process. Fortunately, the rate of malignization of myomas into sarcoma is relatively rare, from 0.4 to 0.8 percent. It's possible to occur in old women. These situations, these fibroids demonstrate rapid enlargement with irregular vaginal bleeding. Fortunately, these patients demonstrate this symptom, this sign, and mostly it is an indication for intrauterine invasive investigation, I mean heritage of uterine cavity, with or without hysteroscopy and the correct diagnosis of sarcoma. More difficult situation is when the process is localized only in the uterine tissue, inside uterine muscles, without contact with uterine cavity. In this patient, it's more difficult to take patterns from the uterus, from the uterine cavity by the sampling. And in these patients, unfortunately, the diagnosis can be late. For the aim of prevention of this situation, you must periodically investigate all patients with uterine myomas for the detection of possible rapid growth of tumor. What growth is rapid? More than four weeks of gestational age within one year. If the patient demonstrates this, this rapid growth, you must be more active in evaluation of this clinical case. At this picture, you see sarcomatose changes of uterine myoma after the section. Clinical presentation. Initially, uterine myomas don't demonstrate any symptoms. No symptomatic, asymptomatic clinical picture according to the small size of tumor. I said that clinical symptoms patognomically associate with location and or possible degeneration. Mostly it's not associated with the number. Sight is more important than size. Tendency of delayed menopause is typical for these patients because of mostly, I said, they have hyperestrogenemia and late menopause. It's also a risk factor for all estrogen dependent processes in female body, including uterine myoma. Menorrhagia. About 30% of patients demonstrate these complaints and symptoms. It's a classic symptom of symptomatic fibroids. Menstrual loss is progressively increased with successive cycles. 
it's a mucous or interstitial fibroids. It's clear because of subserous fibroids, the fibroids don't change the cavity of uterine corpus. Contrary, in submucous interstitial fibroids, the patients have increased surface of endometrium more than 15. There is also interference with normal uterine contractility due to interposition of fibroid. I believe you understand that the limitation of time, duration of menstruation depends on the possibility of uterine muscles for the contraction, its contractility. In uterine fibroids, contractility is low and limitation is also low. Really, it's a foreign body in the uterine cavity, in the uterine wall, in patients with the uterine myoma. Also, congestion and the dilatation of subgiant endometrial venous plexus is caused by the obstruction of tumor. And the natural hyperplasia, parallel process due to hyperestrogenism, anovulation is a cause of menorrhagia in patients with uterine myoma. Metrorrhagia or irregular bleeding due to ulceration of submucous fibroid or fibroid polyps, torn vessels associated endometrial carcinoma. My friends, always pay attention for the patients with demonstration of metrorrhagia, irregular bleeding, because of not uterine myoma. Endometrial carcinoma is most dangerous process with this clinical picture. And of course, in these patients, Sampling of endometrium, total curettage of endometrium, hysteroscopy are strictly indicated for the prevention of malignancy of endometrium and sarcomatose changes of myomata. Another symptoms of uterine myoma, pressure effects. Pressure bladder or rectum lead to urinary frequency or constipation depending on the location of myoma. Again, location, my friends. Remember, we started from the classification of myoma according to the location. Anterior wall, compression of urinary bladder, decreased physiological volume of bladder and necessity for frequent evacuation of urine from the bladder, urinary frequency. Contrary, posterior location of myoma, especially it's a sub myoma, compression of rectum and as a result, constipation. Interligamentous myoma and large cervical myoma, ureteric compression, Formation of hydroureteric and hydronephrotic changes, then infection, then pyelitis, and sometimes necessity to drain the cavity of uh, uh, renal uh, puncture and evacuation of urine uh, from this uh, from this side. Of course, this process is not very active, not very rapid, but if you will ignore the formation of myoma, intraligamentous position of myoma, this clinical result could be finally. Other symptoms of myoma, there are infertility, spontaneous abortions, abdominal pain, pain in low abdomen, Few words about infertility. In patients with uterine myoma, there is a complex of causes of infertility. It could be 
abnormal balance between estrogens and progesterone, I mean anovulation, or lack of progesterone production during the second phase of menstrual cycle, lack of progesterone due to uh, other symptoms, other uh, causes, but finally these patients have endocrine form of infertility. But not only, my friends, mechanical factor could be also important in this group of patients. What do I mean? It could be the blockage of osses of fallopian tubes and the impossibility of spermatozoa to achieve fallopian tubes and the ovaries. Conception is impossible in these patients. Also, my friends, this patient may have occluded cervical canal and as a result also infertility, combination of different causes, different factors of infertility. What else? Spontaneous abortion. Even the fertility is possible. Spontaneous abortion could be due to deformation of uterine cavity by submucose or big intramural fibroids, especially in case of placentation on the surface of submucose fibroid. It's clear that nutrition will be abnormal in these patients. And they can be early or late spontaneous abortions. Abdominal pain, of course, is an understandable symptom of uterine myoma, among the first complaints of these patients. What is the cause of abdominal pain? Of course, it's a result of compression of nerves inside the uterine corpus or pelvic plexuses. It's also the result of necrosis in these patients, it's an abdominal acute pain. It's also the result of compression of endometrium and painful menstruation. It could be the torsion of pedunculated submucous fibroids. It's the result of distension of peritoneum, which covers uterus. And as a result, these patients mostly have one or some kinds of pain. It's clear, I want to repeat, that signs of uterine myoma associated with size, location, number, and the possible degeneration of uterine myoma. What is the basis for the diagnosis of myoma. First of all, typical symptoms and the signs. Be very attentive for the patient's complaints. Be active when you speaking with the patients during the conversation with your patient. Of course, objective examination is also the basis of diagnosis. Very suitable kind of additional evaluation of the patient is ultrasound. What is the main benefit of ultrasound? It's not invasive, but very informative diagnostic procedure. Sometimes, if you need, you add to the diagnostic management hysteroscopy or and laparoscopy according to the location of myoma. But my friends, I want to say now, Remember that hysteroscopy, laparoscopy are invasive diagnostic procedure and mostly we don't use this method of diagnosis only for the detection of myoma. Ultrasound is absolutely adequate method. What for do we use them? For the diagnosis and in parallel for the treatment, for the correction, for the surgery of uterine myoma, for the removal of fibroids. According to the location of myoma, we shall discuss these different kinds of tumor. Subserosal fibroids. 
typically develop on the outer uterine wall. You see it at the picture. This type of fibroid tumor can continue to grow outward increasing in size. The growth of a subserosal fibroid tumor will put additional pressure on the surrounding organs. Remember, my friends, especially anterior and posterior walls. The situation is better if the place of formation of subserosal fibroids is found of uterus. It's not so difficult, it's not so dangerous because of the space upper. The uterus is bigger than behind and near the anterior uterine wall. Therefore, symptoms of subserosal fibroid tumor usually don't include abnormal or excessive menstrual bleeding. They don't deform uterine cavity or interfere with women's typical menstrual flow. This fibroid tumor instead cause pelvic pain and the pressure. Depending on the severity and the location of the fibroids, other complications can accompany this pain and the pressure. At this picture, you see the typical representative of multiple myoma with formation of subserosal fibroid. Pedunculated fibroids. Pedunculated uterine fibroids occur when a fibroid tumor grows on a stalk. A fibroid growing into the cavity of the uterus is said to be a pedunculated submucosal fibroids. A fibroid growing from the outside of the uterus into the pelvis is considered a pedunculated subserosal fibroid. Symptoms associated with the pedunculated fibroids tumor include pain, sometimes severe in case of torsion, and the pressure as the fibroids can sometimes twist on the stalk. Pedunculated submucosal fibroids are accompanied by the severe bleeding, mostly intramenstrual bleeding, Mena regia. The least common of various types of fibroids humus are submucosal fibroids. These fibroids develop just under the lining of the uterine cavity. Large submucosal fibroid humus may increase the size of the uterus cavity and can block the fallopian tubes, which can cause complication with fertility. I already spoke about it. Associated symptoms with submucosal fibroids include very heavy, excessive menstrual bleeding and prolonged menstruation. These symptoms can also cause the passing of clots and the frequent soiling which can take a toll on everyday lifestyle. Untreated, prolonged, or excessive bleeding can cause more complicated problems such as anemia and or fatigue, which could potentially lead to a future need for blood transfusion. Intramural fibroids. Mostly, my friends, all fibroids are initially intramural and only according to the direction of growth, they demonstrate the formation of submucous or subserous fibroids. Intramural fibroids can also cause bulk symptoms. As these fibroids grow, they can cause excessive menstrual bleeding similar to submucous fibroids, which can cause prolonged menstrual cycle and the clot passing and the pelvic pain. This happens from the additional pressure placed on surrounding organs, similar to subserous fibroids, by the growth of the fibroid, which consequently can cause frequent urination and the pressure. 
Physical examination. On general palpation, you can find enlarged, irregular shaped firm uterus that may or may not be tender. Of course, it's possible in slim patients with big size of uterine fibroids. It's impossible to find in obese patients and a small size of uterine myoma. Speculum examination is a useful diagnostic procedure only in patients with cervical or prolapsing layer myoma. By manual examination, in case of uterine fibrosis, is at this picture. It's the most important routine kind of diagnosis of uterine myoma when they are already palpable. When they are very small, when fibroids demonstrate only some nodules, it's impossible to find by bimanual examination, unfortunately. For the aim of early diagnosis of uterine myoma, more important, more suitable, of course, is ultrasound and color Doppler investigation. What findings could be in these patients during the ultrasound? Uterine counter is enlarged and distorted. Depending on amount of connective tissue or smooth muscle proliferation, fibroids have different echogenicity. Vascularization at periphery of fibroids is typical. Central vascularization indicates degenerative changes. Transvaginal ultrasound can accurately access the myomal location. At this picture, you see the enlargement of uterus, you see the fibroid, you see at the right side of picture, you see excessive vascularization on the periphery of fibroid, the encapsulated fibroid, which is also visible by ultrasound. Saline infusion sonography is also helpful to detect a submucous fibroid. At this picture, you see submucous fibroid, which is clearly outlined during saline infusion sonography. The saline infusion sonography catheter balloon is seen in the lower uterine part of uh, uterine cavity part. MRI, of course, MRI is more accurate compared to ultrasound. It helps to differentiate adenomyosis from fibroids, but it is expensive and not widely available. MRI also may be helpful in planning myomectomy or selective surgical removal of fibroids. Similar CT scan, like radiography, computer tomography scanning also has a limited role in the diagnosis of uterine fibroids. All CT scans fibroids are usually indistinguishable from the healthy myometrium unless they are calcified or necrotic. Calcification may be more visible on CT scans than on conventional radiographs because of the superior contrast differentiation in CT scanning. Radiography is the technique mainly the calcified fibroids will be detected. Sometimes by radiography, we find this calcified fibrosis occasionally when we perform radiography for different and other approaches, different and other aims. Hysteroscopy, I already said this is a method of diagnosis and correction of submucosal, mostly uterine myomas. By hysteroscopy, it's a visible object 
round, smooth surface, pedunculated. Sometimes you see the stalk of this submucous fibroid in prolapsed kind of tumor. Laparoscopy, of course, is also very useful for the diagnosis. But don't forget about possible side effects for of laparoscopy and don't use laparoscopy only for the detection. Your aim should be treatment, should be removal of fibroid. Differential diagnosis includes such pathologies as ovarian neoplasms, adenomyosis, malignant tumors of uterus, uterine sarcoma, endometrial carcinoma, cervical cancer, and such physiological condition as pregnancy, when uterus demonstrates its enlargement. Cervical fibroids, it's an especial question, not so typical, not more than 10 per percent of patients, maybe less than 5% according to the population, have this kind of, this location of uterine myoma. Unfortunately, it's not very good condition because of if uterine myoma is localized in the cervix, mostly it's an indication for the radical operation because of isolated removal of cervix is not indicated because of the pres preservation of uterus without cervix has not got really the sense. Treatment. The choice of treatment, of course, depends on the patient's age, desire for childbearing, main symptoms, of course, location, size, and amount of myoma when observation and follow-up is possible. It's possible in small, asymptomatic, especially near menopausal patients. Interval of evaluation of this patient from three to six months. Medical measures. It's possible when myoma is smaller than two months in size, the patient has slight symptoms and the age is near menopause. What possibilities of correction, medical correction, have we got? The first line of treatment of these patients is gonadotropine releasing hormone agonists. What is the sense of their employment? The role of gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists achieve the short period of stimulation of pituitary function. By this time, we achieve desensitization of hypothesis for this stimulation and the depression, suppression of production of LH and the FSH. The result of lower levels of LH and FSH is the suppression of production of estrogens by ovarian glands. And as a result, shrinkage of myoma, decrease in size of myoma. It's our aim. It's a pathognomonic, pathogenetical treatment of patients with uterine myoma. The representatives of gonadotropine releasing hormone agonists are laprorelin and gozerilin. Generation analogs are administrated as a subcutaneous implant. Are administrated as a subcutaneous implant, nasal spray, or intramuscular depot injections every four weeks for 12 to 24 weeks. Although there is a wide range of individual response, a median reduction of in uterine size of 50% has been observed. 
maximum response is seen after 12 weeks of therapy with no added advantage to 24 weeks of therapy. It's necessary to remember always about side effects of gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists. First of all, it's a hyperestrogenic side effects. It's our direct effect. Yes, that's right. But on another hand, side effects such as osteoporosis are very, very important. And we are limited in duration of employment of agonists in our practice. And mostly we use this kind of treatment because it's also limited in time of effect before the operation or in premenopausal women. The time of employment, I am repeating, is about six months, no more. The next type of treatment, antiprogesterones. Mifepristone is very effective to reduce fibroid size and also menorrhagia. It may produce amenorrhea. It reduces the size of the fibroid significantly. A daily dose of 25 to 30 milligrams is recommended for three months. Five milligram daily dose is also found effective. Compared to GnRH agonist, its use is associated with less hypoestrogenic side effects. Long-term therapy is avoided as it causes endometrial hyperplasia, my friends. Don't forget that in these patients we have this limitation. We treat uterine myoma, but unfortunately achieve this bad side effect, I mean endometrial hyperplasia. Selective progesterone receptor modulators. Selective progesterone receptor modulators, SPRM, is a new class of progesterone receptor modulators. They exert tissue selective progesterone agonists, antagonists, or mixed agonist antagonist effects on various tissues, including the endometrium. Preliminary study with SPRM showed that it reduced the duration and amount of uterine bleeding in a dose-dependent manner. Uliprestel acetate is SPRM that has similar effects to mifepristone. Currently marked outside the United States Uliprestel acetate, ESMIA, given as 5 or 10 mg oral daily doses, controls leiomyoma related bleeding in 90% of patients. Now, unfortunately, we avoid to use ESMIA because of then demonstrate, unfortunately, my friends, hepatotoxic effects. These cases are possible, and now we exclude ESMIA from our practice because uh, before the final conclusion, of different societies of gynecologists and endocrinologists. Raloxepin is one of SERMs that have been evaluated in women with uterine fibroids. In postmenopausal women, it reduces the volume of fibroid. However, due to the spontaneous shrinkage in myomata after menopause, it might not be relevant clinically. GnRH antagonists. Cetra relics or Gani relics causes immediate suppression of pituitary and the ovaries. They don't have the initial stimulatory effects such as agonists of gonadotropin releasing hormones. Benefits are same as that of agonists. Onset of aminoria is rapid. 
Aromatase inhibitors, next group of drugs. Aromatase inhibitors inhibit the conversion of androgen to estrogen. In theory, the reduction in estrogen level might be beneficial for uterine fibroid. Aromatase inhibitor Fadrazol was administered to a woman with women urinary retention secondary to a large fibroid. The fibroid volume decreased 71% in eight weeks. Gastrinone. Gastrinone is a derivative of ethinyl nortestosterone with antiestrogen and the antiprogesterone properties. A few studies have shown that gastrinone treatment leads to a reduction in uterine fibroid of up to 40%. Unfortunately, it is associated with significant androgenic side effects. Radiologic therapy, uterine artery embolization. UAE has become on one of the main treatments of uterine fibroids. This is an, an angiographic interventional procedure that delivers polyvinyl alcohol microspheres or other synthetic particulate emboli into both uterine arteries. Percutaneous cannulization of the femoral artery is performed to gain access to and embolize the uterine artery and its branches. Total radiation exposure is similar to that of one to two computer tomography scans or barium enemas. Management of post Procedural pain often requires a one day of hospital stay, following by one to two weeks of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. Many women return to normal activity within one to three weeks. At this picture, you see the scheme of realization of artery embolization. My friends, don't forget that sometimes artery embolization, uterine artery embolization, achieve only the temporary effect. Sometimes in months or years, the symptoms of myoma may come back again by the revascularization of uterine fibroids, formation of new vessels, and the recidive of growth of this fibroid. Surgical measures. Indications for most typical indications for surgical measures, there are the big size of myoma, greater than 12 weeks of gestational age in size. Next, it's a mana regia or metra regia, which leads to anemia. Of course, there are different kinds of pressure effects. It's also rapid growth. I spoke that rapid growth is the enlargement of uterus more than four weeks within one year. Next, failure in medical treatment, infertility or recurrent abortion. There are most common indications for surgical intervention in patients with myoma. There can be two types of operations, organ preserving and organ carrying. Approaches are laparotomy, hysteroscopy or laparoscopy. Myomectomy. The standard surgical treatment for women who wish to retain the, their fertility is myomectomy. Case control studies suggest that the risk for intraoperative injury with myomectomy may be low than the risk for complications from abdominal hysterectomy. 
Myomectomy may be considered even for women with large uterine fibroids. Conversion to hysterectomy is less likely. Fertility is retained. But don't forget that these operations, operations of myomectomy in large uterine fibroids should be very long and the duration of anesthesia is also high. Don't remember about risks of this long general anesthesia. Hysteroscopic resection. Submucous myomectomy is performed by hysteroscopy, whereas intramural or subserous myoma by laparoscopy or laparotomy. Hysteroscopic resection of submucous fibroids also can significantly reduce heavy menstrual bleeding in 82% of women with submucous pedunculated fibrosis type 0. 86% with sessile fibroids type 1. And 68% of patients with intramural fibroids type 2. Laparoscopic myomectomy. A systematic review of randomized controlled trials of laparoscopic versus abdominal myomectomy found that laparoscopic myomectomy was associated with longer operation times but reduced operative blood loss, less postoperative pain, fewer complications, and more patients who recuperated fully with two weeks. Laparoscopic myomectomy also may be feasible at in women with large fibroids. In a series of 332 consecutive women undergoing laparoscopic myomectomy for symptomatic fibroids as large as 15 centimeters, only three required Laparotomy. Hysterectomy. Hysterectomy is indicated in patients with large myoma, numerous tumors, obviously symptomatic patients, no wish to preserving fertility, suspected to malignant transformation. They could be different kinds of hysterectomy. Most typical for the patients with uterine body fibrosis, there is supravaginal or partial hysterectomy when we remove only the body of uterus. When cervix is affected, we prefer, of course, logically, total hysterectomy, the removal of uterine body together with cervix. Myomas during pregnancy. Few words, few words about this situation. Impact on pregnancy and delivery. I already said about abortions, but not only. It's also preterm labor, fetal malpresentation, placenta previa, birth canal obstruction, postpartum hemorrhage due to abnormal contractility of uterine muscles. And also, my friends, I spoke about possible red degeneration of myoma during pregnancy. Clinical findings in these patients are rapid growth of myoma, pain, fever, leukocytosis. These patients mostly need in conservative treatment. There are no candidates for surgical intervention. Okay, my friends, thank you for your attention. Have you any questions? Please write. My friends, what was difficult for you? Have you any questions? Don't sleep, please.
who has any questions, please write me and ask me. If there are no questions, thank you, my friends. Continue your work with text, uh, and Mayoma, and remember that today it will be test for you. Please start to use our recommendations, start to uh, solve uh, clinical case reports, and the work with test, please, my friends. You are welcome, my friends. You are welcome. Goodbye.